What's going on, guys? Welcome to the Creating Wealth Podcast, where I, Kyle, from Kyle Curtin Real Estate, interview local top dogs in the real estate investing, wealth building, and personal finance industries. Let's build together. What's up, guys? In this episode of the podcast, I had a really great time chatting with a spectacular guest. Chris has accomplished so much in the real estate investing world and shares some truly incredible wisdom about keeping the positive energy, looking at the downsides and unforeseen risks of a deal first, putting others' needs before your own, and so much more. Chris's story is amazing, and I hope you enjoy. Let's jump right into the episode. What's going on, guys? Welcome to episode 27 of the Creating Wealth podcast today. I have the great pleasure of interviewing Chris Roach from Crowd Lending, a direct hard money lender based in Boston. What's going on, Chris? How is everything going, man? Hey, I'm what, very excited to talk to you. What's up, Kyle? <laughs> Kyle, thank you very much. I'm real happy to be here. The pleasure is all mine, man. I swear. I'm very excited. <laughs> as, as am I. Lots of positive energy, my man. Positive energy. Always got to keep it positive. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you know, so to kind of jump into things a little bit, you know, if you could kind of tell me, you know, a little bit about you, uh, bleh, I got tongue tied, a little bit about what you do, you know, a little bit about like crowd lending and, you know, kind of how that got started and tell me, tell me a little backstory. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I'm a lifelong Boston resident, very proud, uh, born and raised uh, in the city of Boston. In my family, as I said, I grew up in Charlestown and my family's been there over a century. My mother came from Dorchester, the Dorchester part of Boston. I had the, uh, you know, unique experience of kind of living in different parts of the city because my mother was from Dorchester, my father's from Charlestown. So I bounced around a little bit, but I, again, a lifelong Boston resident. Prior to real estate, my career path was government and politics. Uh, out of high school, I, you know, went to college and I was a city of Boston employee and you know very active in in you know municipal city government in boston and working on political campaigns and uh in 2001 kind of got burnt out with politics i was working really hard and kind of spinning my wheels and i had always had a passion for real estate i got my real estate sales license and began grinding doing sales rentals and management my long-term goal was to always be a, a real estate investor and to get into real estate investments and to do real estate development. And by way of you know grinding, uh, doing sales, doing property management, doing rentals, I, I would you know work really hard to to do whatever I had to do. I was able to you know find a good mentor. I went to work for an investor who owned a large-scale portfolio. He was also a, a hard money lender. That was in 2007. And I started originating hard money loans for him uh, at Commonwealth Equity Funding. I was working for Brian Anderson, a pretty renowned, established uh, real estate entrepreneur in the city of Boston. And you know, he taught me the real estate game. Uh, he taught me how to hunt uh, off market deals, how to add value, how to see value how to look at a property and identify its highest and best use uh also you know uh to simply identify properties that are cash flowing he was a a buy hold guy also uh you know a a rehab flip guy primarily he was doing the the burr method you know 15 years ago before the acronym was created he taught he taught me that and i was lucky you know it was an unfortunate time for a lot of other folks during the 2008 financial crisis. You know, people were losing their homes due to foreclosure. A lot of people were, you know, losing their homes either via short sale or foreclosure. And uh, it was an opportunistic time uh, as a real estate investor to, to buy real estate. So I was pretty active during that market and I, I learned quite a bit and began you know, flipping properties. I was simultaneously originating hard money loans. So as a as a hard money loan uh, originator and doing underwriting, you know, it really helped me to be able to 
you know, uh, analyze deals and, and, and see, what, you know, it, what the profitability was and whether a deal made sense or not. And also kind of ha have a great, um, you know, my fingers on the pulse of the market, have a good network. But again, my background, you know, was that it was hard money lending, uh, house flipping, uh, buying and holding, you know, three family, multi families, buy distressed, stabilize through renovation, rent the property, and then refinance out uh, into, you know, a, you know, conventional mortgage. Um, had a few multifamilies, and then you know I continued to originate loans. And in 2014, uh, my two partners at Crowd Lending Inc. I was approached by one of the uh, co-founders, Chris Fumara, who's a very successful real estate developer in uh, Nantucket and Newport, Rhode Island. He builds new construction homes and uh, also has a, a pretty extensive real estate portfolio. And Chris just, you know, I had the, you know, the, the, the business acumen in the background uh, originating loans. He said, I want to start a new company called Crowd Lending. And originally the concept was going to be like a, a crowdfunding scenario where Mr. and Mrs. Smith could kind of click on a loan and invest, you know, 30, 30 K or something to that, that effect in the loan. And, it ended up not going that route, but we, we liked the name. And then in 2015, you know, my two partners, Chris Fumara and Dan Ajarian founded Crowd Lending. And, you know, I became the, uh, an executive with the firm. And, you know, I've, my focus has been on business development, um, training, recruiting uh, originators, and also originating loans myself. And uh, business has been very good. And, uh, we're continuing to grow and scale. Wow. That is quite the story, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can certainly dig a little deeper, but I, I wanted to give you the, um, you know, a, a condensed brief version just to the intro. Cause I know we have a while to go. So I, <laughs> we can peel the layers of the young and uh, as we, uh, continue the dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, totally. But that is, that's really crazy, man. You know, from, starting off as like a real estate agent, you know, just kind of coming along and getting your license and, you know, getting to the point you're at now, you know, you have all these different things going on and, and meeting with all these different people and stuff. That's, that's quite the journey, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, it's been, it's been, it's been a good ride. And again, it, not without uh, failure and speed bumps and curveballs. I mean, that's just yeah. life period. Yep. Uh, I've certainly, I, I've had, a, I've had the, the fortune of having some success but I've also made some, some mistakes too, along the way so from, you know, with respect to real estate investing, and I'll be happy to discuss those with you as well. Um, you know, there's a saying in real estate, if you're not earning, you're learning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's I, I, one of my, my favorite quotes. And I, I, it really rings true uh, a lot of times because, you know, you, you, a lot of people, it, it's not HGTV, real estate investing. You know what I mean? There's a, there's certainly, there's, there's a lot of different components and a lot of different aspects and, uh, it's easy to get hurt and you spread yourself thin and make mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> yep. Um, so could you actually dive into, you know, kind of like the loan origination and stuff? And, you know, I know you were doing that, like the majority of, you know, kind of your real estate investing career so far, you know, and that was like a, a really big part of it. Um, yeah. You know, how did you kind of get started with that? And, you know, how does that kind of work? <laughs> So it, it's really interesting. I, when I, when I, 2007, so it's 2021, um, the gentleman that mentored me and, and taught me the business basically said, Hey, listen, you're going to go find people to borrow money to buy real estate. And, and I, I said, okay. And, and I was like, well, how does that work? And, and, yeah. and, 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 and kind of break it down for me. And at, at the time, uh, he explained, you know, well, there's short term loans on investment property only, you know, this, these types of loans on for Mr. and Mrs. Smith, who are buying their primary residence. It's specifically for savvy real estate investors that are doing house flipping or condo conversions, or in, in circumstances where somebody needs to act quickly on a property, if the property is not financeable, if it's missing plumbing and electrical work, or the kitchens aren't in, or if it's just a really competitive market and someone needs to close quickly. Yeah. So people use hard money lending because of speed, 
ease and simplicity. It's not always the best option because it's it's certainly more expensive. So I, I'm not promoting it. it it's it's kind of like when people look at it, a, 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 an investment or a real estate investment, everything is a cost benefit analysis. And if somebody can acquire a property with cheaper money, then by all means they should. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? But in a, in a real competitive market and, and if somebody wants to close quick, that's why they'll come and use a hard money lender. And, or again, if a property is not financeable for a, a host of reasons, if it's in disrepair and it wouldn't qualify for conventional finance, and then somebody would seek financing from, from a hard money lender like crowd lending. Yeah. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. You know, I feel like that's a really big thing too. Um, you know, that it is definitely, you know, like a really crazy tool to have in your tool belt. But like you said, you know, like it might not necessarily be the best, you know, it, it's, in certain situations, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, no, it's a case by case scenario. And, yeah. and, and honestly too, like uh, it's expensive in, yeah. in it's really like perfect for your rehab flippers, you know, that are buying single families or, you know, cause it's a short term loan. The, the longer you're, you're carrying that debt, the more in, the more money you're paying. It's real simple. So it's like, you want to be in and out of it quickly. You, you want to be able to execute, you, you know, the, the construction management aspect of it, get the property listed and get it sold. Like if you're into a, a hard money loan for a year and a half or two years or something longer, you're not making any money. It, it, that's just equity that's evaporating. Yeah. You know, it, it works when you need to close quick your experience. You can go in there, you can execute the renovation and, and, and the uh, construction get it done, get it listed, get it sold, you know, that, and, and in those scenarios is when it works. And we, I mean, we fund new construction, we fund, you know, it, the, the whole gamut, but again, you know, time is money in real estate investing and it, it, you really have to be experienced and savvy uh, to execute properly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, so to kind of jump into the next one, uh, what is your drive and your vision for the long term? You know, even like maybe what it was, you know, when you were first starting out to versus, you know, maybe now kind of how things have changed. So we're in a real funky market right now. And, and, and throughout my real estate career, uh, I would say this is probably the funkiest market that I've ever experienced. And, and I'll, uh, I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. So I've experienced uh, a few cycles, you know, I got in in 2001. That was a robust market that was like real hot and, you know, totally crazy. And each year as it ticked up, you know, I was a little bit younger and uh, a bit naive. And, you know, everybody was saying, you know, it's going to crash. It's going to crash. And I, I was a non-believer that, that the real estate market would crash. Then obviously in 2008, we had that, that, you know, financial crisis, which was, you know, really devastating to, to the real estate market. And, you know, then we experienced a lot of uh, appreciation and growth uh, year after year from 08. So the market like right now, it has certainly apexed, but the issue is it's obviously there's no inventory. There, there's absolutely no inventory. So like, it's crazy how competitive it is and uh, interest rates were low. They're, they're recently now starting to tick up a little bit. Rents were at historic highs. However, the rental market due to COVID, uh, due to a number of things, it, it has definitely decreased. So you have all these, um, you have a, a multitude of variables kind of all converging. And it's like, how does that impact the long-term market? And how does that impact the market right now? So that it, it, my point simply being is I, I don't know, you know, I don't even know if like the MIT economists know that, are, that are certainly a lot more educated than I and, and, and study it a lot more deeper than I, it's, 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 we're being driven, the market's being driven by low inventory and all time and, and prices are at all time highs. So from, from a real estate investor standpoint, like speaking specific to the city of Boston, you can't really add value or buy anything that makes sense. Like you certainly can't pay retail yeah. and, and, and add value. Uh, you know, that like it's real difficult to, to, to find things that cash flow in Massachusetts period. 
Yeah. So for for instance, you know, like when the market was was appreciating, oh wait, everybody was buying in Boston, Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan. You could buy three families that cash flowed all day long. You know, real serious cash flow. You could buy it. It would cover all your expenses, and then there would be a a, a good amount of positive cash. Then as the market ticked up, the, you know, the buy and hold investors started to spread their their geographical coverage area. Uh, people started buying in Worcester. That that market has now ticked up considerably. The Fall River, New Bedford market, like nobody would go near that place. That place is on fire. Uh, and then now, for instance, Springfield, when I would get calls 10 years ago and somebody said Springfield, I'd hang up the phone. I wouldn't even talk to them. <laughs> now I listen to them. And I, now I ha- now I'm, I'm, I'm all ears because the numbers actually make sense. Yeah. So the, even the Springfield real estate market is actually – strong right now and so i'm speaking specific to the massachusetts real estate market as a whole uh and 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 in the recent um patterns that it's experienced and so you know in in terms of like where where i'm going to go i'm trying to watch the market as close as possible so my specific niche as as a hard money lender there's always going to be a need and a demand i've been fortunate as i said to to be around a couple different cycles because no matter what in real estate investing, there'll there'll always be a need for speed, and there'll always be properties that aren't going to qualify for conventional financing. There's always going to be demand specifically for crowd lending and for hard money lender. So I, I I'm fortunate, but uh, again, there's just it in terms of investors out there finding deals, it's really limited, it's really competitive, and it's really tough uh, right now. Yeah, it really is. And I feel like that's, you know, a really interesting thing that you said a minute ago about, you know, about like the constant need for, um, you know, other forms of financing, you know, that maybe like people can't get bank financing for whatever, or, you know, would you agree that there's always going to be, you know, kind of that ugly house in the nice neighborhood, I guess, you know, so to say. <laughs> there, there, there will be, because here's the thing, like I, I've actually seen properties that were bought renovated and are now dilapidated now, i've been around that long where i've seen i've seen properties that i was personally involved in in some capacity whether i was a broker or, or an investor or a lender and and somebody bought a property and renovated that property and now it's it's, it's run down and dilapidated so so they so it, it, amazingly enough uh yes there'll always be that ugly that one ugly house on the street um yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I honestly haven't really thought about that before. You know, like, like that again. that's, uh, that's extremely interesting. You know, that like, yeah. there's always going to be, you know, like, yeah, you know, you're able to, to like flip that house and stuff now, or, you know, do like all these crazy renovations and, you know, like do what your strategy is and everything and, and make sure it works. But maybe like 10 or 20 years down the line, you know, everything's going to change, you know, and somebody's going to have to come along and do it again. You know, yeah. just like the, the really long term, um, you know, kind of strategy, um, like of there always being problems that or opportunities, I should say, you know, out in the yeah. market that that might have been opportunities a couple of times before. You know, and, and, and we, regarding real estate investing, I mean, there, there's always opportunities. I mean, probate is really like one of the best, you know, routes or avenues to, to find uh, quality deals. And then if you're in the development game kind of like identifying the highest and best use uh, of, a, of a site. Um, me personally, we can talk a little bit about development. Like I've done some development and uh, I'm tired of community meetings and I'm tired of like going to the zoning board of appeal. Yeah. And it, you know, it, it takes a lot of stamina uh, quite frankly. And you know, it's a lot of work and a lot of guys are very successful and, and, and good at in the city of Boston it's a, it's a lot more difficult. There's a lot of red tape and it's real slow moving. Mm-hmm. I think, I think outside the city in the suburban towns and in, maybe in some other cities, uh, it, they're that a pro development and it, the process is a little bit smoother, but Boston is really slow moving and, and really difficult. Even if you're an expert in, in your experience at, at navigating that realm, uh, yeah. it's still pretty, um, slow moving. Is that, you know, just kind of normal for like, I guess, Boston, you could say like, just kind of how regulated, that kind of thing is you know with the zoning and it's not that it's 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 a matter of regulation it's just a it's unfortunate that um 
you know, the city of Boston just isn't managed properly and lacks efficiency with respect to its departments. Uh, quite frankly, if uh, if you're familiar with the ISD building at 1010 Mass Ave, like that, there's a there's a couple other um, departments that are in there, like the, the fire departments in that building and the parks and rec departments in that building, and the, the the entire building should be designated to the inspectional services department. Like they're understaffed, they're under equipped, and and they lack efficiency. And and then good people that are that are trying to develop stuff, uh, you know, get caught up in the mix, and they, you know. Unfortunately, uh, certainly respect uh, all our city workers, yeah. but uh, they're not the uh, the quickest to, to jump to things, you know? Yeah, I can imagine that's kind of, you know, another curveball that, you know, is just kind of like a bridge that you have to get across, right? You know, among like all the other variables and stuff for projects, you, know, you just kind of yeah. have to have to work with it. and. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's many steps, you know, depending on the size of the project. Mm -hmm. You know, and so in depending on, in they, they determine it by by square footage. So you, you, there's a that that would then determine the amount of red tape. You know, you have to go to the the, the BRA, which is now the Boston Planning and Development Agency, and you get approval from them. You have to go through the community, get approval through the community from the different civic associations. Then you have to go to the zoning board of appeal and, and get approval from the zoning board of appeal if there's variances, if there's something that's not as of right. And, and, and that all sounds simple and that all sounds easy, but you know, that can be an elongated process. Then once you get approved and you have approvals, you have to get permits. And that in and of itself, it, it can be quite a, uh, again, elongated process and, and, and pretty difficult. So I, like a lot of people love it, don't get me wrong. Yeah. I'm, pers I'm personally, uh, you know, not interested in doing it anymore, just in, in the city of Boston, again, uh, because of, uh, again, just being under equipped and, and not being the most efficient uh, with some of that. Yeah, I totally get where you're coming from. You know, it, it definitely sounds that that can be, you know, a whole nother, a whole nother variable, basically, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if guys are doing small projects, like two, two units, three units, four units, yeah. The, the, pro the process is a little smoother. I think a lot of people always underestimate the time, you know, and, and, and stuff. I, I, I did some larger scale projects that really beat me up and, and took a lot longer. So I'm a little jaded. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I don't know how we got on that subject, but like we're talking <laughs> specifically for like development, real estate development and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I, I definitely see where you're coming from. <laughs> Uh, moving on to our next question, Chris, uh, what are your thoughts on building relationships and expanding your network? Yeah, so uh, networking and education equal opportunities, man, you know, and, that, and, that, and that's one of my, uh, my favorite sayings. And, and I really believe it like me personally, I'm, I'm fortunate to have a great network that I, I've worked hard for for many, many years to build and solidify I really uh, maintain good relationships and, and seek uh, good people that I do business with. And, you know, th there's nothing more critical to success in business than having good relationships with people. And when, and when, and when you do have good people, you, you, you keep them and, and you, you keep doing business with them. And, and everything is reciprocal and everything is, is definitely, you know, quid pro quo. Like you, 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 if somebody helps you, you help them. You know, nothing's for nothing in, in the business realm, you know, yeah. in the personal, in the personal realm, it's different. And then you just always have to take care of people, you know, that you do business with and you always have to do right by them. And there's nothing more important than maintaining uh, quality relationships with good people, people with high integrity, good values, with good work ethics, and that are generous uh, and, and, and honest. Of course. And smart and smart. Well, not everybody is, Kyle. Exactly, quite, yeah. I totally uh, agree with you. <laughs> quite frankly, you know. Yeah. They're, you know, a lot harder to find than one might think. <laughs> yeah, and when you do, you stick with them. The grass isn't yeah. always greener, you know what I mean? Uh, if, you, if you're around good people and you have good people on your team, there's always speed bumps, there's always curveballs, there's always personality conflicts, but you work that out. If at the end of the day, if everyone's hardworking, honest, you know, uh, accountable and, 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 and detail oriented to, to accomplish the task. And, you know, you work everything out, you work together. Yeah. The sky really is the limit. 
you know, when sure you find is. those right people that they really synergize with you and, you know, that are doing a lot, like much bigger things than you are. And like, you're able to help them out. They're able to help you out. And, you know, like you said, you know, starting off like positive energy everywhere. You know what I mean? To, to get Always. to where you guys want to be. <laughs> Always positive energy. Always. Yep. It's the way to be. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, what do you consider to be the biggest variable in expanding your clientele? And that's a good question. Uh, so my sphere as a hard money lender has become more competitive when I, you know, first started lending, you know, again, in like 2007 in the city of Boston, there was really only a couple of hard money lenders and, you know, they were like uh, older gentlemen, you know, there was a couple of attorneys, there, there weren't any real big companies. And the, so the, the lending space has become more competitive and people have a lot more options. There's a lot of national lenders. Um, you know, I, I definitely always underscore like at crowd lending, you know, we have a real intimate knowledge uh, of the Boston market yeah. and it's real important to have a, a relationship with a direct lender. Uh, you know, like a, a port, there's, you know, there's different lenders too. There's, and there's different types of loan products. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about that. But, um, yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I did. Uh, I meant to ask on the last question. I know, uh, you have a meetup. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. The greater Boston real estate investor network group. I have a Facebook group that's super active with, you know, high quality professionals, uh, lots of off market deals, lots of, um, you know, no, nobody, no, there's no, I really try to filter it and, and keep it clean and keep it focused, focused on networking, education, and, you know, people are welcome to promote themselves and, and so forth. But yeah, we have a meetup once a month. We meet the last Tuesday of every month at Alma Gaucha, which is in Boston on at 401 D street. It's a great Brazilian steakhouse. The food is amazing. The atmosphere is great. The people there are great. We've had some amazing uh, turnouts. We, we have a really great speaker coming uh, this month. Um, Ricky Belvo from, um, you know, Volney oh, Capital. Man. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, EVO, like, he, you know, he's just, um, he, you know, he's like hitting it out of the park. He's, you know, I know, I know Ricky pretty well personally. And, um, you know, he's got a, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of units he's completed and he's building. So um, he'll be there as our featured speaker. So um, this month will de definitely be jam packed, you know, yeah. uh, and the meetups have been going great. It's, it's real important, again, networking and education and again, taking that positive energy and, and then rolling with it. You know what I mean? It's like get, taking a big Prozac or something every month <laughs> after the meeting because, you know, I'm skipping out of there with, you know, so many good like-minded people just looking to connect, work with each other and, and educate themselves. Yeah. Honestly, you know, like the feeling that that you get most of the time when you come out of a meetup like that, you know, is is ridiculous. I love it so much, man. Like just from like talking to so many people and like, oh, you know, I get to talk to this guy. Like, you know, let me follow up with him. And like the doors that open up are crazy. You know, like the amount of the amount of minds under one roof at one time is ridiculous. You know, like it's awesome. I can't say enough about it. I agree with you completely. It, it really is. It, it'd be the energy level is unmatched and then, and, and then you know, I usually fly for about three or four days. I'm skipping around afterwards. <laughs> yeah. I totally agree with you, man. And that, uh, I wanted to kind of get into one thing too, about that. You know, I've noticed, I mean, I obviously haven't been kind of doing this for too, too long, you know, thinking about the bigger picture, but like what I have seen is like, all it takes is one conversation that can completely change your life. You know, like if you talk to one person and like, you know, they even share like one idea or something at that meetup, like literally everything can change, you know, and like oh. just having like all those opportunities to talk to all those people. And like, you know, the same thing goes for them too. You know, like you might talk to somebody and like completely throw them on a different path. You know what I mean? And like, you just never know what can happen. Like just from going out and, and just meeting with people, you know, I'm extremely excited about your meetup, by the way. I, I gotta make it over that. <laughs> Listen, I, honestly, I mean, in today's you know technology-driven digital era, 
there's nothing more valuable than interfacing in person yeah. with somebody and, and getting to know somebody like in person. Yep. I mean, like we're, we're connecting right now, but you know, when you, when you, when you hang out with somebody in person and you can, you really can either establish a connection or establish that this is a person I don't want to do business with or, yeah. or be affiliated with, but it, it, it's really invaluable. I can't underscore yes. it enough that like meeting in person and, and networking is really so critical. And it has been, you know, one of the keys to my, you know, my success. And, and it's just always been being personable and, and, and being present and, and being willing to, to, to grind and hustle, but, but knowing the value of, of meeting and interacting with people and, and being professional and, and being responsive and being courteous and, and, and really like um, interacting on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, you know, unbeatable, you know, and I feel like you can pick up a lot more, you know, in terms of like body language and, you know, like just a lot more things that like you might only be able to see in person, you know, versus like, you know, on Zoom or, or whatever, you know what I mean? And you're totally. right, it, the connection is definitely a lot stronger, you know, especially if you hit it off, like, you know, you go in there and talk to somebody, you feel like you've been talking to them for 20 years, you know what I mean? Like it, things just click and it's, you're right. It, it's a lot stronger in person than it is, you know, on Zoom. I mean, obviously, you know, we kind of have to work with what we got, you know, in the day and age that we're in or whatever, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yep. I'm with you, buddy. Ooh. So what is the most important lesson that you have learned over your career? So, um, you know, that's a great question. And, um, the most important lesson that I've learned over my career. So specific to, to like real estate investing or real estate lending uh, is to when conducting my underwriting or analysis is to look at my downside. Mm -hmm. uh, I think like most people look at a deal and they only look at their upside. So, you know, like, like my, for me, one of my, you know, most important lessons or, or skills or traits or, you know, like when, when looking at something like, you know, what's my exposure, what's my risk, what's my downside, how do I get hurt? And, and, and then looking at it from there first yeah. and then kind of jumping from that platform and, and then looking at, you know, um, you know, whatever kind of profitability or whatever might exist, but um, you know, like what, what's my downside. And, and I think when people look at deals, they only see upside, yeah. they don't see the unforeseen that, that is always, uh, that always occurs in real estate investing and they don't see, you know, like the curve balls, you know, like, like there's so many different things that I could, I could talk about all day long that, you know, you don't see account for or expect, but happen. And, you know, so, so for me, you know, it's like, what's my downside, you know, real simple. And, and I always try to keep everything simple. You know what I mean? Like keep it simple, stupid kiss. Of course. You know? Yeah. I think that's extremely interesting, you know, to be able to kind of see like, you know, maybe like the smaller holes, you know, in uh, like a pro forma or something like before you start to see, you know, kind of what everybody else sees to I, I just think it's really interesting, you know, to be able to kind of see like, I guess the story of, of the potential deal, you know, instead of like, you know, just being like blind to just seeing, you know, like the cash on cash or whatever, you know, what like the upside is, but also seeing like potential things that you might have to watch out for. Um, you know, and just kind of getting like the entire picture, you know, and not just the half that everybody wants to see, you well, know, I, I think you know, that's really interesting. Unfortunately, I've done it in the past. Yeah. People can, people can actually become delusional and lie to themselves mm -hmm. and, 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 and certainly not by, uh, intent, but, um, you know, look at a deal and, you know, like underestimate, you know, your construction costs, like right now, um, materials are absolutely like building materials are like through the roof. Ridiculous. And yeah. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was looking at a, uh, you know, pro forma, uh, today and, 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 and kind of conducting my underwriting and looking at the, um, it was a new construction loan and looking at the price per square foot. And, you know, it, it, it was a bigger project, like 8,000 square feet. And, and, and the gentleman had like $220 a square foot, which is really on the low end. And, uh, you know, I would say a minimum of 275 to $300 a square foot, but people have, 
you know, I can get the labor cheap. I can do this cheap. I can buy this, I can buy this cheaper. And it's like, no, you can't, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and here's the other thing you don't want to underestimate things. Like, you know what I mean? So my point is that it's easy to, 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 to fool yourself and, and, and because people only want to see the upside and, and they, and they want to, you know, uh, be successful and, 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 and make a project work. But you know, the bottom line is you have to be super strict, you know, in doing your analysis and, and so forth. Yeah. I feel like that's a definite, oh, no, ouch. <laughs> that's especially true now, you know, with the super low inventory, like just like trying to get things to work and like subconsciously like, oh, you know, I, I only see this, like, you know. <laughs> yeah, because it's just so hard to find deals anyways. And, just trying and, to force and, it. Yeah. And, and, and again, that's something that you got to be careful of. Like, and, and, and this is kind of like a Warren Buffett quote and, and, and my, my, my mentor that I really learned a lot from, like he said, he said no to like 95% of the deals and 95% of the loans that he saw. And I, you know, I used to get so frustrated and, you know, I, I, I and now, you know, 20 years later with all the experience that I have, I, I, I understand why he said no to pretty much everything. You know what I mean? Like, yeah like it just didn't work you know bottom line and i would want to i would want it to work and i would do everything i could to try to sell it and but the you know everything's based on math and science in, in, yep. in real estate investing and and at the end of the day you know if that math and science doesn't equate to profitability then it doesn't work you know real simple yeah yeah definitely Ooh, this one is uh this one usually kind of trips people up a little bit um yeah how, i like how, I've, I've been tripping my whole life <laughs> me too <laughs> <laughs> um how do you define wealth uh easy question how do you define wealth so wealth is uh, you know determined by family mm -hmm. and uh friends and i'm you know the wealthiest guy in the world i have the most beautiful wife and i have you know the most beautiful children I have a beautiful home. I come home at night and I, I, my wife was waiting for me and she had a great dinner waiting. I, I had my son and I was at my friend's house and I was able to, to help my friend uh, with some life guidance with his son. I have a great family and I have a lot of friends and I consider myself the, you know, the wealthiest guy in the world. And that would be my definition of wealth. Quite frankly, I wouldn't change who I am. Uh, to be anybody else i love that chris that's honestly it at the end of the day you know like just just what makes you happiest you know like and to be able to you know be around people like that and it it's it kind of completes you you know yeah i mean I, i'm materialistic don't get me wrong i want i want material things i work hard i want to be successful i like making money yeah. but in, it, with you know you asked what my definition of wealth is you know th that's my definition of wealth you know so, you know, I have everything I've ever wanted. Um, honestly, if I, I just want to sustain yeah, what I have. I want to exactly. sustain what I have and solidify, solidify my retirement. And, and I did. I almost had that done. Made a couple of mistakes, you know, back to the drawing board. But that's yeah. life, you know. Michael Jordan told you how many times he failed before he succeeded. And Wayne Gretzky said, you know, you'll miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Yep. You know, all those things really kind of like uh, reverberate, you know, through my mind all the time. Yeah, they're 100 percent true, you know, especially yeah. with the way that, you know, you look at failure, too, as I, I forget exactly what the quote was that you said earlier, but I like it a lot. Well, if, you like if you're not earning, if you're not yeah. earning, you're yeah. learning. Yeah. And, 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 and that means you, you get it. Like I've been in real estate transactions that weren't working out. You know, like I did a big 24 unit new construction development project in South Boston and it was, it was barely a break even. And, and at the end of the day, between paying uncle Sam and, you know, paying investors and stuff, like I, I got out by the skin of my teeth and, 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 and that saying really um, applies in that situation. You know, if you're not earning, you know, I learned quite a bit, you know, I bit off more than I could chew. I was overextended. I was outside my wheelhouse. You know, I used to flip single families. I used to convert two families and three families. And that was my thing. I'm a lender. Uh, you know, I have a background in development, but it was more on a smaller scale. And I jumped into a big project that was too big for me. And, and that, that particular saying really rang true then. If you're not earning, you're learning. And I, I learned quite a bit. 
Yeah, I love that statement so much. I'm gonna remember that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't. It didn't originate with me. So <laughs> none of my material is uh, original. It's so I just, true, though. I just copy and paste. <laughs> hey, if it works, it works, right? <laughs> that's, that's right, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more about that one, man. You know, like just the way it, of looking at failure, like it, it's really interesting the way that, you know, like we're traditionally to, or you're, meh, we're traditionally kind of brought up to thought about failure, like even just going through like the traditional school system and stuff like that you know, that failure is a bad thing. And yeah, it, it definitely sucks when it happens. But like you said, you know, if you're learning from it, then the next time that you're in the same situation, like, it's not going to be as bad. You know what I mean? Like, you're going to have that knowledge, like that super active, like, you know, I was here before. But, you know, now I have this extra knowledge of doing this. And it, like, you're just going to keep better and better, bettering and bettering yourself. You know, the, the well, more that you try things, you know, here's the, rea here's the reality. You're, you're going to fail at a lot more things in life than you're going to succeed. Yep. Yeah. You, you're going to, you're going to have a lot of failure. And again, you know, the real successful people just learn from their mistakes and from their failure. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, like just keeping, keeping going on different opportunities and stuff and yeah, you know, but if you're able to accept that, you know, most of them, well, I don't know if most, but a lot of them will fail, especially like the first time that you're doing something, you know, like there's, there's not a whole lot of people that absolutely crush whatever they're doing on the first time they're doing it. I mean, it does happen, but I mean, not necessarily like sustainably, you know, no. but, but yeah. <laughs> Ooh, what is uh, something that you thought about? business networking or wealth creation that changed as you went along uh good question you know i guess with respect to like business you know i, I when i learned the importance uh, uh, of listening to the people i'm doing business with and their needs and not trying to sell whatever I'm selling, yeah. but like, you know, if I'm doing business with an individual or, or, or folks or, or whatever, really like listen to their needs and try to put their needs before mine mm -hmm. and then try to be generous without obviously allowing people to take advantage of you, yeah. but be, be kind, generous, fair, and put other people's needs before your own because everybody wants an immediate instant gratification in today's kind of society. But it, by, you know, putting others needs before your own in business, you benefit from it in the long term. And, you know, that's something that changed, you know, when I was younger, I was a bit more overzealous and a bit more aggressive and a little immature. And as you grow older and you become more mature and, you know, some people obviously have it at different ages and different stages in life. But when I really realized that, you know, if I put other people's needs first, uh, always first, uh, you know, then, you know, I, by virtue of doing that, I will be successful in, in whatever my needs are and goals are will become fulfilled, you know, long term. Yeah, I love that. It's really crazy. Like, I don't really understand why people, I guess, are, you know, pretty much like just selfish, I guess you could say. Cause even like, you know, like you said, like just putting other people's needs before, you know, your own, like if that's, you know, kind of the mentality, like going through your head, then like, you're doing great things for them, you know, and like things are, are getting easier for them. And like, you're happy because you're getting the satisfaction of helping them out. And then, you know, sometimes it, it comes around, you know, and then people, no, it does, them. it does. But even it if does. not like just the gratification of, of helping people and, you know, helping well, them get to the higher places and stuff. Yeah, you can put your head down at night and go to sleep and, and, and sleep yeah. good. But uh, it is a catch-22. You, you know, you want to always put others' needs before your own. You, you always want to be direct, transparent, and honest. But at the same time, you don't want to let people walk all over you. Yeah, definitely. And you, and, and you have to you have to be guarded and be aware. Uh, it's, you know, real estate is very cutthroat. And, you know, everybody comes at you with a smile and a handshake. Yeah. <laughs> but um, unfortunately, it doesn't end that way always. But... Again, you know, if you're if you're direct, you're honest, 
uh, you make a mistake, you're accountable. You know, like you own it and, you know, mistakes are going to happen. You address it, you clean it up, you, you're, you're direct, you know, you know, it's okay. Everything will work out, you know? And, uh, you know, the main thing is again, like putting others needs before your own. Yep. It's so true. <laughs> On to our next question. Uh, what values are most important to you when it comes to doing business? I know we've talked, you know, a good amount about um, actually, you know, kind of what you just said a couple seconds ago, you know, just kind of putting others needs before your own. And you know. yeah, so I, I can simplify that. So like that, that, you know, that that's definitely that was like a lesson that I learned. Uh, but like with respect to me personally, I, I like to keep everything simple. Mm -hmm. But you regarding values, it's real simple. Do the next right thing. Real simple. I, I, I mean, it's really not even that difficult. Like, you know, easy does it, you know, dot your I's, cross, cross your T's, dot your lowercase J's mm -hmm. and do the next right thing. You know, that's it. Yeah. You know? It's simplicity. It's so, yeah. <laughs> I like that a lot. It, it's so simple, but it's, it's so effective. It's so true. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's just crazy. do the next, do the next right thing. And then the next right thing isn't always the easiest, Yeah. but no matter what the, the end result is great. Like owning something, especially like, again, making mistakes, being accountable, addressing the mistakes, cleaning them up, being direct with people, being honest, being fair, being reasonable, being uh, solution oriented, you know, if you're not, you know, if you're not focused on the, the solution and you're only focused on the problem, then you're not going to solve anything. Yeah. You know, you got to be solution oriented, you know, you can't, you know, you can't complain and whine, yeah. you know, you gotta, you gotta just like, see, it's always going to be, again, I, I mentioned it earlier, earlier, there's always going to be curveballs. There's always going to be things that are unexpected. You just got to work in the solution, you know, all right, we can fix it. No big deal. Like, well, let's, let's, let's figure it out. The world's going to keep spinning. You know, we'll figure it out. Yep. I love it. <laughs> uh, last but not question. Uh, <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> Don't worry about it, buddy. You're doing a good, you're doing a good job. Thanks, man. <laughs> but, yeah, I told you, I, I respect your hard work and, um, you know, everything about you, you're, you're grinding. You should be proud of yourself. You're a young man, you know, you're putting yourself out there and you're doing a great job. You should be really proud. I appreciate that a lot, Chris. You have no idea. All right. Let me try saying that again. So our last but not least question. There we go. That's, that's the words. Um, do you read and what is your favorite business investing or real estate book that you would recommend to anyone? So this book um, is more specific to life, but will help people in business more than they could possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. And then the name of the book is the four agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. Have you heard of the four agreements? I've heard of it. I haven't read it. It's on my list. <laughs> All right, so, so the four agreements, number one is to be impeccable with your word. Always be impeccable with your word. Number two is don't take anything personally. Like think about that for a second. Like how hard is that to do? Very like different. don't, don't <laughs> take anything personally. Yeah. Don't and, and get this one. Here's the third agreement. Don't make assumptions. Don't assume things. Right. So listen, what happens is assumptions begin to compound. So you make an assumption and then you make an assumption based on an assumption. What does that equate to? I don't like those Mad odds. Yeah. <laughs> Mad madness. Total madness. Yep. And then the, the fourth one of the four agreements is always do your best. Always do your best, you know, be impeccable with your words. Don't take anything personal. Don't make assumptions. Always do your best. The four agreements. And I, Hey, listen, I, I fall short. You know what I mean? But I try to live my life by that mantra. And you know, those are great when you, when you're, when I, when I'm really like, and it could dig a little deeper, but I would recommend that book to anybody in the world by Don Miguel Ruiz, The Four Agreements. And forget what it'll do for you in business. It, it, it'll, it, you know, if you can take those four agreements and, and, and really apply them in life, you said earlier the sky's the limit. Well, guess what? The sky just got a lot closer. I love that. I'm going to order that book. I'm really, really excited about that one. 
<laughs> yeah, do it. Yeah, just Google it, read it, and then get the get the book. It's amazing. Yeah. Even like you said, like you know, if you're able to implement stuff like that, like really good. I mean, it. <laughs> who knows well, what's possible, thing. right? Like, <laughs> like be impeccable with your word. Think about it. Like, how many people are are, are, are like totally impeccable with their world? With the word, excuse me, uh, yeah. you know, like everyone's scheming and plotting and, and, and trying to sell their products and yeah. and push and smile. Everyone has an agenda and they, everybody promises the word world so that they can get their agenda, you know, and, and, and it's unfortunate, but but that's the way of the world. And, and not everybody does that, but but a lot of people do. Yeah. But I mean, if you're if you're a man who's impeccable or a person or a woman who's impeccable with their word. You know, people are going to really value you and really respect you and really trust you. And, and then not only that, you're going to value and trust and respect yourself. Yeah. Which is the it's most important, important. Yeah. which is the most important thing. You're going to love yourself, you know, more than anything. And then not to take anything personally, unfortunately, I fall, I'm a little, I'm a little sensitive and I fall a little short in that, in that subject, um, in that line quite often, but I'm not perfect, you know? Hey, we all uh, are, man, you know? We all have yeah. our, our things we're working on and stuff, you know? It's nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's a, work, it's a work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> That's not a bad thing, you know? Always have, have things to be improving and stuff. And No, I, Kyle, every day I try to educate myself, you know, read a little, always networking, continuously working hard. I'm an old school guy, whereas when I was in business, you know, 20 years ago, you know, most of my referrals were just from being like a good dude and word of mouth. Yeah. You know, I, I, it's like I'm not a technology driven individual or a real tech savvy guy. And I got to be competitive in today's marketplace. And, you know, you got to be a real social media savage and you got to be real tech savvy and creative. But at the end of the day, if you're a good dude and you're practicing those four agreements, you're impeccable with your word, you know, you're always, you know, honest, direct, transparent, you know, things are going to be good, man. You know, yeah. people are going to want to do business with you. People are going to refer you. It's like a good movie. You know, yeah. all the advertising in the world doesn't change it. It's all, it's like, Hey, go see, did you go see such and such? You know, the more you hear, you know, if it's good, it's good. You're going to hear about it. Exactly. You know, if you think about it too, like, yeah, you know, like it's definitely, you know, a little bit of a different era, you know, with the internet and like the influence and everything, but think about it this way like what if the internet literally just went away one day and you know like you still have all those people from you know like you said of just being a good dude you know and and helping all those people out and everything and you know like the word of mouth and the relationships like all that's like it's separate from the internet you know what i mean like it, it's always going to be there the internet's great it, it's leverage but like that doesn't beat you know the fact that you know, just the way that like you've treated people and stuff like that, you know, and the, the genuine connection. That's right, buddy. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much for coming on here, Chris. It, it was oh. truly a pleasure. Yeah, Kyle, like I said, keep up the good work. You're doing great. You're working hard. You should be really proud of yourself. I'm happy that we're, we're finally able to do this. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. And, you know, we're, we're going to continue to, to talk to each other and, totally. and, and, stay, yeah. and stay connected. And, you know, if, if, if whatever I can do to help you, um, I'm here for you, buddy. You too, man. I, I'm going to try to hit the next meetup too. It's, uh, it's the day after. I'll remind, I'll, I'll remind you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very excited. But um, I did want to ask you, is there, you know, any like social media links or anything? You know, like, can I link, um, you know, any sites or anything for you or? The yeah, so, is, like so, so, you know, um, I have, you know, my Facebook page, which I'm looking to grow, mm -hmm. which is the greater Boston real estate investor network group. And then, um, uh, you know, my, um, different, my, you know, my, my website is hard money, greater mm -hmm. And, you know, my Facebook page is hard money, greater Boston. Um, you know, my, my Facebook business page, and then, you know, obviously I have my LinkedIn page, which is just myself, Christopher J. Roach. My Instagram is, again, Hard Money Greater Boston or Greater Boston Hard Money. And, uh, you know, those are my social media um, platforms. Perfect, man. Guys, I'll link all those below. Go check Chris out. He's a really cool dude and he's crushing it. And it, it, it's amazing. <laughs> but yeah, Thank you, you know, Kyle. 
All right, guys, that concludes our Creating Wealth podcast episode for today. I want to thank every single person that has listened this far. It really means a lot to know that people can learn from me and with me as we build wealth together. Hopefully, you can take home at least one thing from this podcast that will improve your life just a little bit. If you could, please check me out on social. That's at Kyle Curtin Real Estate on Instagram, Facebook, and I'm on Bigger Pockets. Until next time, let's build together.